so um we're going live now Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome on this um, little delayed first uh, session of the, the Wu Just New series, the, the Juflix. Uh, we're very happy to, to have you guys with us. Um, we know it's very difficult times right now for a lot of you uh, in very different countries uh, to stay at home. And a lot of other unions have also uh, organized web series that are uh, absolutely unique and incredible. So. Like if you look for uh, stuff to do, uh, there is a lot happening for you right now all over the web. Um, my name is Jonathan Brown. I'm the president of Fujus, the World Union of Jewish Students. Uh, we work around 50 countries pretty much. Uh, the first episode, uh, so COVID-19 True News, um, was built to bring you experts that will be able to tell you the true stories and what's happening behind the scenes uh, and all around the globe. Uh, we will then finish by a little Q&A with um, both of the speakers, but also with an Italian student back home. Um, and I would like to remind you also that uh, you can uh, ask questions to our guests uh, through uh, the YouTube chat or through the um, Twitter of Fujos. You can just tweet at Jewish students, hashtag Netflix, uh, Jewflix, sorry. and uh, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Yaron Suissa. Uh, he's very experienced uh, in management, business development, and strategy in uh, biotechnology, healthcare, and diagnostics. Uh, he's the CEO of One Cell Medical. He's the co-founder of uh, JLM, which is Jerusalem BioCity, uh, which is leading the strategic activity, the funding, the branding, and the promotion of the organizations and the bio ecosystem of Jerusalem. Uh, he's a board member now at Jerusalem Bio City and Votis, and he's a senior research and development uh, business experience in the bio industry. We're very, very lucky to, to have him speak to us, uh, and we're very happy to have you, um, Yaron. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good. So uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the coronavirus. Um, you see that I moved the slide, right? We're good. Okay, so I just wanna say a few words before we start. First of all, the authorities in each country, meaning the health ministries in each country are the authority, okay? Whatever I say now could be changed within a day or two, could be changed based on new evidence. I'm only going to say that most of the data that I present here is based either on the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the USA, and uh, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization. And um, having said that, just keep in mind that the, the, the data is constantly updated and therefore every few days there's a change either in the way we should behave or with other uh, insights. So maybe we should just start by saying that um, coronavirus is a virus, okay? You can see, I put here a few pictures. You can actually see at the bottom of the of the slide, the reason that it's called corona is because it has crowns. But unlike regular crowns, meaning uh, what you would think is a good thing, actually these crowns are what is, are the means that enable you to penetrate the human cell. And as you can see here on the right, just so that you see the differences between a human cell and a virus, um, the human cell is between 10 to 100 times bigger than a virus. It really depends on the virus. But coronavirus is actually quite a, a little virus. It's not a real living animal, just so that you know. It's actually not considered a living uh, creature by the definition in biology, but it has an envelope. The envelope is what you can see here at the bottom, and inside there is an RNA. RNA is a molecule, you probably heard about DNA. RNA is another kind of um, genetic material, just that it's not like DNA, it's a bit different. And once it gets into the host, the human cell inside our body, it starts to do all sorts of things basically it becomes proteins, the proteins are becoming some other things, but eventually the virus, all that it does is like a regular parasite. Just like you have uh, parasites on humans, you have parasites on our cells as well. It gets into the cell, it makes itself, um, it reproduces within the cell and then it kills the cell and moves out. And later on, I will explain why is it such a problem with uh, the coronavirus when we're discussing um, uh, patients and harder conditions in patients. 
So as you can see here, basically, this is how the, uh, the coronavirus looks like. Okay, you can see the inside. And I just told you that there's the RNA, right? So the RNA that you can see right over here inside, it's like a little, um, it's like a curled sort of a molecule. And you have the spike, you see the glioproteins, which are basically the means for the, uh, for the virus to enter our cells. And it uses the, the proteins in order to get in the, glio, the glioproteins. It uses it in order to penetrate our cells together with another uh, enzyme, another protein that is called hemagglutinin. You don't really need to know the names, it's just uh, professional names. But basically when it gets into the cell, then the RNA that we spoke about before is the, um, the means for the virus to reproduce. And then actually it lyses the cell, it explodes it, and then it goes to the next cells. So this is basically how it works. And the reason that I'm telling you that, not just because I want you to know the professional terms, it's not the, the really important thing. The important thing is to understand that this is, this is the mechanism that the virus is using. And because of that, the, um, the diagnostics tool that are trying to identify the virus that you probably hear all the time, they're being tests. So these uh, diagnostic tools are actually uh, targeting this kind of molecules. So one molecule, one molecule that they target, which is the most specific one is the RNA. The RNA has a sequence like our DNA. It is actually a replication of our DNA into a different, for a different um, uh, function, but altogether it's a very, very uh, strict kind of a sequence. And therefore what's been doing, what has been done with diagnostics is that there is a certain uh, method that is called PCR. And I, what it does is basically, if there is an RNA in a patient's blood because the virus exploded the cell and then RNA goes out again, then we will see residual RNA molecules in the patient's blood. Now, as you can imagine, it's not that the patient starts with maximum, um, with maximum uh, uh, levels of RNA, but with the course of the disease, the levels of RNA will go up. And if the person starts to get healthy, then they will go down because the immune system is killing. During this time, the diagnostic tools are meant to find out whether you have this RNA or not. The more sensitive the diagnostic tool is, the better it, it helps us to understand who is sick and who is not sick. Today, the main and the most advanced uh, method is this PCR. Basically what it does is that it targets the sequence of this RNA. And if they have it in the blood, then they can tell you that you are either sick or that you just healed from one because also some of the RNA could be at the end. Usually what they wanna see is that the level of RNA is below the detection of the, of the diagnostic machine or the diagnostic uh, process. Then that it means that you really are not sick anymore. And just a couple of days ago, I heard about it before, but a couple of days ago, there was a new uh, method. The problem with the PCR method, the first one that I told you about is that it takes a lot of time. It takes between two to three hours just for the reaction itself. And you're talking about taking the sample from the patient and going through a whole process. So another method, which is probably a little bit less sensitive, but much, much faster mm -hmm. is the one that you can see on the right side of the, at the top of the, of the slide. And this one is actually just like the ones that you have for a pregnancy right? When, when a woman wants to do a, pr a pregnancy test at home, then you need to see either two lines or methods are based on the same kind of uh, process, meaning there is a certain protein that is being tested from the patient's blood. Okay, in our case, it could be, and you can look back at the picture, it could be the M protein, it could be the S protein, the spike, the, not the, the N protein or the E protein, it could be the spike glycoprotein, the S, but basically one of them is being targeted. And what happens is that there's a chemical reaction that in the case that this protein exists in the sample, then there will be a chemical reaction that will provide a certain color. The color is exactly what you see. And this is more or less similar to other methods of diagnostics. So we have two kinds, mainly two kinds of diagnostics. One is targeting the RNA, which is a much longer one, but a much more, a, mu a much higher and specific uh, method but it takes time. And you have the other one, which is actually to do more of a, of, um, of a screen of a lot of people, because if you wanna know exactly the situation, you go to the PCR one, but if you wanna screen a whole population, if it takes four hours per person, it's for ages. That's why these kind of methods are also um, invented in general, but also in this case. Now, the next thing that uh, I would like to show you is the spread of the virus. 
one of the issues in this case that was discussed in many countries and a lot of people were actually in shock was the fact that people said, but yesterday we only had two patients or 20 patients. Now we have a million. How could that happen? So this is because of the rate of infectious of infection. Um, you can see on the right, there are all kinds of diseases, right? So you can see, for example, in the table on the right, you can see that seasonal flu, usually a person would infect between one to two people. If it was swine flu, it's about two people as well. But if you go to coronavirus, you see that it reaches about, it could reach up to five people. The darker red means that it, the, the infection is much more effective. That means that if someone is less, uh, um, that the virus once it infects the person, the certainty of becoming sick is for some reason higher. And what it means is that if you start with two people, then two people will infect at least four people. And that goes further and further. And the problem starts when you talk about, it works in powers basically. So if you think about that, you have a thousand sick people and nobody's treating them, then it's a thousand equals a thousand people, which will become a million. So to emphasize, I know that Italy and Spain is already a very, very uh, hard situation, but even in Israel, we had 10 days ago about 100 patients. It's been 10 days, now we have almost 1,000. So you can see that these numbers are working. And there's a good question because there should be many more in Israel and also in other places over, uh, over the world. So I'll explain that in a few moments. But the reason that I told you that is that even though there's a certain um, uh, fatality per age, or I would say differently, the, the percentage of death right now is between half a percent to 4%. It really depends how you look at it. But I think that the most important thing in this case is not the general, the average percent, but actually the people that are at risk. And having said that, you have a group of people basically above the age of 60 that are in very, very, very high danger. And that means just so that you can see the numbers, people above 60 in age are at the almost 4% um, chance of death. It means on every 100 sick people, four will die, which is a very, very high number. And if you go into 80, 80, uh, 80 years of age and more, then you can see that it almost reaches 15%, which is really, really crazy. So the reason I'm saying it is because it has a real impact on the population. And let's just take one more step before I'm going to say why I think it's very important. So we all have friends, okay? And friends is a very good thing. But one of the problems with this is that, um, let me just try and move this, okay, because it bothers me. Okay, so you can see that it's not enough if, I mean, one of the parameters that would say what your chances of surviving such a disease is your age, but the other one is your background disease. And when I talk about background disease, people with cancer, hypertension, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, and above all cardiovascular disease, nobody really understands why, because cardiovascular is not straightly connected to um, uh, respiratory problems. And in this case, it seems that the reason for the death is mainly complications with breathing, with the breathing, with respiratory, uh, with the respiratory system. But altogether, the reason that I'm showing it is because, in the population between the young ones, also us that are be, be, um, below 50 and probably you below 30, um, there are many of us who has uh, chronic diseases that some of them were actually never found out. Asthma, for example, is a huge risk. Most many people, especially at the, end, at the ages between 20 and 30, are not, even, are not even aware that they have an asthma because we're in great shape and we're young. And being exposed to such a disease could actually provide a very high chance of a risk to your friends as well. And the reason I'm saying all that is because people have to understand, and I hope that everyone who's hearing me right now, this is a matter of uh, life and death to me at least. And I think that you have to, to understand that by being young and healthy doesn't mean that you're not putting at risk your friends or your grandparents, even your parents in some cases, and many other people you don't even know about. So I'm just saying it because at least I see in Israel and also it was in Italy and in Spain for a bit, that many of the people didn't really understand the, com the consequences of not listening to the uh, instructions of the government. And I'm not into uh, let's become a, a totalitarian uh, uh, regime, but on the other hand, I think that in this case, it's the only way to, to stop it. And very soon I'll show you how dramatic it could be. Now, let's say a few words about the transmission. 
So the incubation period is basically averaged between two to 14 days, meaning that patients that were infected after two days already showed some of the symptoms. In some cases, it took them 14 days, but this is the average. There already has been a few cases where people who were actually sick were actually um, uh, were, ha were infected over 14 days before they started to show symptoms. It's much rare, and therefore, all the health organizations are putting it aside. But again, it shows that the potential of this virus could even become worse. So because of that, it's very important to stop the transmission. Now, if we're talking about the mode of transmission, so there are basically two main ways. One is direct contact, which is the main reason, okay? And the other one is the droplet infection or in close contact. Drop droplet infection means that when someone is coughing or you, at you, or in your direction, or sneezing at your direction, the virus, which is in our mouth mainly, can actually be spread in about one to two meters all around. It could be even more, but the main uh, dose of the virus would be in this uh, distance. And then the, the droplets of our saliva that fly, we don't even see it sometimes, are the, but people have to understand that this is the only way to really do that, to really infection. And that's where social distancing comes in as well. Before I already told you that there's the issue of a one to two meter distance between people. It's because when you sneeze or when you cough and actually also when you breathe, there's a certain energy when you do it. And up to two meters, most of the, drop, the droplets will be dropping down because of, um, because of the um, uh, gra gravity. And by taking this distance, and this is just one of the examples, you're actually saving your friends and also saving yourself for being infected. And I think that this is, again, this is something that is very against our nature. We are actually a social animal, just like, my, just like the monkeys for that matter. And we do look for being close to our friends, to our families. And you have to understand that even kissing your cousins or your nieces or your little kids, kids are very, very dangerous for the adults in this case, because usually kids get Get uh, infected much, mu get infected much faster. That is because um, the immune system is still developing. They don't have any symptoms whatsoever, meaning you cannot even know if a kid is sick or not. And also, a kid in many cases won't put, won't pay attention attention to the things that could actually infect the adults. For example, babies they put their hands everywhere in their mouth, in their nose, in their eyes, and then they will touch you. And if they touch you in your mouth by mistake or in your nose, then you may be in trouble. So this is again, the reason for social distancing and, and, and as a parent, I can tell you it's not easy, but we are very, very strict because we think that by doing so, we're protecting not ourselves, we're protecting our elders. And this is exactly the reason that such pictures should not be seen in the close future, at least a few weeks from now, if not several months. Um, this goes because you can see here in the graph, before I showed you the red uh, uh, graph, where you see the exponential elevation in the number of sick people. Okay, that's what we said before. But now look what happens if you look at the social distancing. Okay, the, you are actually getting here the, the difference between two kinds of social distancing, not two kinds, two days. If you go from day 20 to day 21, okay, you can see that in day 21 and day 20, we've managed to, um, to delete 40% of the new cases. By the way, this is the reason that in China, it seemed that it had worked because people are actually keeping the social distancing everywhere where they go to eat with their friends, with their family. And this is the real reason. And right now uh, there is no other way of fighting this disease since there's no um, relevant cure. There's another thing that I need to say here and that is masks. So just a few facts. Most of the masks are not even relevant. They're the best we have, so we're using it, but it's not really a mean for uh, protection. The mask that is considered the most effective one is named N95. N is like um, LMN, so N95. And this mask has holes at the, level, at the size of 0.3 microns, okay? Just to, so that you understand, the size of the virus is 0.1 micrometer. So it's actually smaller than the holes in the mask. The reason that it helped is because the virus in many cases gets caught within the, um, the saliva droplets and that's why it doesn't go in. But on the other hand, if you use a mask for too long, then you'll be breathing it back into your, uh, into your lungs. So that's why you have to be careful. It has been proved 
that the masks are helpful in two cases. One is when a person is sick. So in the case that you sneeze by mistake and you didn't manage to put your hand in time to protect your, uh, your surrounding, then the mask will do it. That is one. And the other one in the case of uh, uh, health, um, I would say doctors and nurses and people who are work with sick people in general, an environment with a lot of sick people, because then it is something that is, is an additional protection. But altogether, for example, for people to walk around with a mask for no reason, it, it doesn't really work. And you should know another thing is that the masks in general um, have a certain lifetime. It, they get, um, they get uh, um, the, the holes are getting uh, filled with all sort of dirt. And then you're actually breathing regular air. So if someone wants to use a mask, I'm not saying don't use it. You just have to understand that you can use it only for a short time. And then you have to change. I'm talking about most of the masks, not the N95. All the surgeon mar uh, masks, for example, and similar kinds, it will help at a certain level, but you should understand that it does not give you the total uh, protection that people may think. And the other problem is that it has a psychological, psychological effect, just like the gloves. In the case of mask, again, people feel more safe. And by feeling safer, you start to do, you start to make mistakes. For example, you feel that you're protected and then you'll scratch your eye or you'll try and touch something, or you'll think that you can do whatever you want. You don't have to be careful of other people. You won't keep the social distancing. This is why masks also have, have they can be considered and they should be used in certain cases. By the way, I just heard today because when I prepared this uh, presentation, I didn't know it yet, but today it was told that for the first time, it may be true that also mask may be a protection even for healthy people. But again, it wasn't proved yet. It was something that was, was reported in China. So it keeps changing, like I said, I'm saying in general, even if you want to use a mask, that okay. The only important thing is that don't underestimate the, the potential to being infected even with a mask. So as I said, right now, there is no real uh, uh, solution. Everybody's working on it. There are many kinds of drugs that are being tested, but I will say just a few things. First of all, there are many drugs under tests. Many companies are trying to find a way to change it and to find something that will work. And like I said before, most of the drugs are trying to find something that could attack the virus or the process that the virus needs in order to start the cycle of infection. Before I will tell you the drugs are less a few words about the virus. It's not that if you get one virus from the air, you're gonna get sick within a minute. It doesn't work this way, it's dynamics. It's like if you wanna feel a bus, it takes a few minutes. If you wanna feel the body with the virus, it takes some time. The virus reproduces itself. Usually what happens is the virus gets into your, into your um, um, into the tissue that it can infect, as I said, inside your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. Usually it's the mouth or the nose, less the eyes. But again, also the eyes could be a, a, um, an issue. And what happens then is that once the virus gets there, it starts to infect. In many cases, your immune system will kill it. It's not that every time you're being touched by the virus, you're going to get the disease. In many cases, it doesn't happen. But when it happens, it means that the virus managed to reproduce faster than the immune system managed to react. Now that I've said that, I will say another thing. Most of the cases of the, I would say severe cases of patients that has been infected by the virus is because the virus created such a mess within a person's lung that the immune system is attacking the lung itself. It, happened already, it happens all the time with other diseases. It's not something new, but that is why one of the things that uh, you're being told is that in the case that you feel that it's hard to breathe, it's time to check with a doctor or to call the 911 or your emergency services in your country and ask them to come and check you. Don't go to the hospital. In Israel, at least, we've been instructed to call them in. And the reason is that if you have certain uh, markers, then you will be hospitalized because it, because it can actually be taken care of then. Now that I said that, I will explain the uh, rationale of these uh, drugs. You have various drugs and each one of them does something a bit different. So. Let's look at the drugs themselves. I'll just say that the drugs are targeting various uh, particles within the virus. Okay, you can see here, it could, uh, <coughs> it could uh, target something within the virus. It could attack one of the, of the um, um, excuse me, it could attack one of the proteins that are on top of the virus. It could attack the RNA, various options. Now, you probably heard, at least in Israel, we heard about the chloroquine. You can see here in the table number five, was uh, showing very promising results. It doesn't really consider that it's working yet, but it was showing 
very, very promising re uh, results in, um, in some cases in the States, in the US. The thing is that it wasn't proven yet. And I already hear that many people want to buy chloroquine. You don't have to buy chloroquine yet. It doesn't mean that it's really working. We have to wait and see that really the results are working. But I will only say that you have several kinds of, um, uh, of, uh, of drugs. One of the important ones is the steroids. And the reason that I'm saying steroids, because steroids are not actually against the virus. Steroids are actually against the, the immune system. What they do is that they balance the immune system from going crazy and attacking our own body. So this is basically, um, these are the drugs that are mainly under development, some of them in more advanced, some in less advanced cases. In Israel, there were eight different ones that were approved for, um, for treatment. You can see here, the names are here. If you want, we can talk about it later. But the one that is very interesting are the immunoglobulins. You can see them here because immunoglobulins are, is something that is actually being produced by the body. It's the antibodies that are attacking the virus in, in case that there is an antibody, in case that the body has met this virus before. It's a little bit similar to, to the case of being bitten by a snake. When you get the treatment, you're not getting anything from the immune system. It's actually something that was taken from the immune system of an animal that was introduced to the snake's venom and then using that in order to stop the venom. And this is the idea in immunoglobulins. Um, I will only say that, that, that there are various approaches to treat the virus. It's important to say that it's not antibiotics. Antibiotics doesn't work in viruses. There are several vaccines who are meant in order to create a prevention, but that's again by 2021. There are anti-RNA drugs, like I said before. It's very interesting in Israel, there's a lab in the North that started developing um, an, a vaccine for the coronavirus in chicken a few years back, four, four and a half years back, and they think they will have a solution in three to six months. But this is in order to uh, vaccinate the population that was not infected. The only thing that now we are doing is one cell medical, my company, is that we're looking to, to use our technology, which is a very advanced technology, in order to create a sort of a treatment that will be also helpful <coughs> Uh, against the disease. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. So thank you very much, Sharon. First of all, it was, uh, thank you for catching up the time. I know it was a bit shorter than expected, but it was uh, really, really interesting. Uh, we'll just, uh, before answering the questions, we'll make uh, Nadav speak because he, he will be also short on time. Uh, and then I have a few questions. Uh, so if you can stay around, Jaron, and then after Nadav speaks, uh, answer all the questions, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, Nadav, if you want, you can um, up your, uh, your camera and your sound. Um, Nadav is, um, is our second guest today. Uh, he's a professor uh, and the director of the School of Public Health at Ben Gurion University. He researches uh, a lot on and focuses on various aspects of health policy, combining his multidisciplinary training as an epidemiologist, um, a public health physician, and um, public health ethics. Uh, he's involved in several research projects related to the legal and ethical aspects um, of public health practices, including the pandemic response and health inequities. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. The, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, what I'm going to do after the previous excellent uh, presentation is give you maybe a bit of a broader uh, picture and where are we going uh, from here, including uh, discussing some of the economic, social and uh, legal uh, aspects. Um, so first of all, I need to say that uh, all those that are working in the field of uh, epidemiology in public health uh, in some way are not so surprised. Unfortunately, I myself involved in this uh, pandemic uh, preparedness uh, for about 20 years. We developed in Israel about 20 years ago uh, a platform to teach uh, field epidemiology and we had always a module about a pandemic, uh, mainly using pandemic influenza as one of uh, our models, but also Ebola and later SARS. 
uh, SARS actually is very important here because after the SARS outbreak, uh, there were lots of lessons and one of them was to uh, implement a new international health regulation that unfortunately are not working so well now. And this is very uh, sad because the idea was with the international health regulation to set the expectations among different uh, countries uh, to see that uh, there'll be some standard measures uh, taking that countries will uh, exchange information to have a clear case definition for cases to develop a standard approaches for testing uh, and many to help uh, developing countries to develop, uh, to do capacity building. Now, while at the beginning there was a uh, quite uh, some coordination with the WHO. Uh, currently, many countries are doing uh, different things. You saw probably the initial reaction by the UK. Um, and while the whole idea of uh, social distancing, quarantine, isolation, of course, is very important, the question is how we can continue now uh, if uh, useful, successful, we can know in Israel in about two to three weeks if the measures taken were okay, but how we can return back to normal life. And th this is one of my main messages here. First of all, we're going to get over this pandemic. That's very important. This is not Armageddon. Um, of course, we can see what's happening in Italy. I myself have my sister, uh, now in Italy, she's pregnant. So as you can imagine, we're quite uh, stressful about that. Uh, but uh, even in Italy and other countries, finally, we will need to see how we are going back uh, uh, to normal. So in terms of what was happening here in Israel, we started with the first phase of uh, preventing the first case. And then things were very, very centralized in terms of having just one laboratory in Israel in order to have it um, as a gold standard. Uh, then uh, we started to establish all the system of epidemiological investigation conducted by the different uh, health districts. Um, and then the idea was of uh, containment. So we knew that we we're going to have the first cases, but we wanted to gain time. Uh, and here Israel was uh, quite innovative in terms of uh, closing uh, borders, doing epidemiological investigations. Now we knew that we are moving to the next stage, like now, and this is a stage of mitigation, meaning that is already widespread transmission in the community, but the idea was to gain time and to flatten the curve. I'm sure you heard already about uh, this uh, uh, term. Um, then the idea was to develop uh, a widespread testing system that uh, unfortunately took some time. Uh, from today, we have many different laboratories spread around the countries, more than 20, in order to have a national level system that is doing uh, the testing on population based in order to see what we are uh, doing. And even more important, a system that need to do testing um, for the medical teams because they are the first responders and they are, and this is very uh, important. The next challenge that uh, again, unfortunately took some time is to take all the mild cases and have them at home because we know now already that uh, about 85, 90% of cases are going to be mild cases. So the challenge would be to triage in special locations, have all the mild cases either at home or in the community and have only the 5% that are um, more complicated, uh, take care of them at the hospital. This is why we need to clean up the hospitals to have more space, but second also to protect the medical staff. Now, we are moving already now to the stage of uh, widespread transmission in the community. And the 
one billion dollar question literally now is where Israel is going to be in terms of the epidemiological uh, curve. Uh, we can only know soon, uh, only can know now in the next week or two because the screening and testing system is only now uh, available. Um, and in two weeks, three weeks, we'll know where are we going to stay. But this is already the stage that we need to push to think about the, the next level, because if successful and if in the next coming weeks, by both doing what was presented before about the personal um, behavior and the social distancing, um, in terms of uh, moving the mild cases to the uh, community and do the proper isolation, uh, we can know only in two to three weeks how these measures actually influence uh, uh, the situation. And then hopefully if we can really say that uh, things are under control, we need to think already about the next stage. And this is about when we are going to ease the current uh, quarantine and isolation measures. Now, if the curve will continue to go up, probably, and that's definitely one of the options uh, according to the different models. So maybe we need to stay unfortunately for quite long time in the current situation. On the other hand, if uh, in few weeks we'll see after Passover that the situation uh, is, is under control, we need to be very careful about our decision-making and there are no clear answers uh, right now. Um, we need to remember that public health is not just about epidemiology and the physical component. It's also about the mental health. It's also about vulnerable population that are now mainly the elderly that also need to be um, surveyed more. We saw already in Israel that the first case was in the compound of uh, taking care of the elderly. And this is something that uh, happened also in many other countries. Um, we need to see that people are doing physical activities and we need to see that if this is going to move on uh, for several, for many, many weeks and even months, how other healthcare conditions are being uh, taken care and this is now the current challenge of uh, the situation. Now, I don't know how many of you are following uh, the situation in Israel in terms of uh, different uh, measures. Um, tomorrow there'll be a, a report published about, that was supposed to be published already a few weeks ago about uh, control of infectious disease. Um, there are lots of uh, lessons that uh, needed to be drawn already such as um, the depletion of resources from the public health system. I really hope that uh, these lessons are going to be taken uh, into consideration. Um, and on top of that, I want to stress the importance of uh, trust uh, when you are moving on with uh, public health measures, because if there is no trust from the public, uh, compliance might be very low. So. There is a balance here between having uh, the public understanding the gravity of the situation, but on the other hand, having the public really understanding the importance that uh, the government is taking care, not just uh, regarding the physical health, but also mental health and also the economic consideration. Uh, Israel started uh, an economic plan a few days ago regarding people that are unemployed. And these things are very important, not just from the economic aspect, but also from the public health uh, uh, point of, uh, of uh, view. Uh, there were suggestions to do tracing of cell phones, etc. I myself must say that uh, I don't think this would be a good solution because we saw already that many people that were traced according to the cellular phones, uh, there were lots of uh, mistakes someone that just was waving to his uh, partner that was in isolation and was said to be also in isolation, things that must finally be taken care of uh, uh, real public health uh, physicians. So we need to remember that technology is very helpful, but it cannot solve um, the issue of doing proper uh, epidemiological uh, investigation. In many weeks from now, we need to think also not just about PCR, 
but also about uh, serological um, tests. Serology can give us not just the current situation of a person, but uh, give us also the um, information if someone was infected according to the antibody uh, levels. These are also things that are uh, being now uh, developed. Uh, and in general, I must say that uh, all the scientific community now in Israel has been is being mobilized, all universities, including Ben Gurion universities, but others, uh, to do work from basic science to clinical research, as Yaron was mentioning uh, before, uh, developing uh, vaccines, and also doing social studies research in order to understand issues of compliance, uh, behavior, trust, uh, etc. This is a very unique time uh, for the world, of course, and also for the Israeli community. Israel is well known for innovations and I'm very happy uh, that uh, the scientific community is really heavily uh, involved. Um, teaching at Ben Gurion University, for example, and all other universities were moved, of course, to online like now. Uh, we're trying now to improve our teaching methods because it's not only about lecturing, there are lots of things that can be done uh, within the medical system, telemedicine and remote health, of course, is now uh, becoming even more important. Things that were developed uh, in recent years are now finally being implemented at a large scale. And I'm sure that this is going to revolutionize both uh, the medical system, our life in general, public health, and also a uh, teaching. I, I have another role uh, that now it's a bit on the hold that I'm uh, the advisor of a uh, national planning process for the Israeli healthcare system for 2048. We started our planning process about eight months ago. It's a two and a half years process. And already before the, the corona outbreak, a pandemic, we were talking a lot about moving healthcare system balance more to the community uh, about home care. And I'm sure that this current uh, event is teaching us uh, lots of lessons that are uh, going to be uh, implemented. So just to summarize, uh, we are now entering into the third phase of mitigation. Uh, we are now entering into the most challenging uh, part. The time that we got uh, in the previous uh, measures that Israeli took uh, some of them quite early in the process, hopefully are going to be presented now, the, the fruits of uh, these measures. Um, we need to continue and protect the healthcare workers. We need to protect the elderly. We need to move people as much as we can to the, to the community. But to think already about the next step, uh, when we're going to declare a successful mitigation, how we need to move back to regular times. And this is very, very challenging and hard to tell uh, right now. So sorry that I'm a bit brief because I need to go now to another uh, meeting. It was a great pleasure to spend some time uh, with you and I'd love to take later. Uh, maybe maybe I can take now a question or two and uh, uh, and go to the to my next meeting. So first of all, thank you so much for having joined us. Uh, we know now it's the uh, golden age of all the scientists that finally get credit and go on TV to speak about uh, all the, the knowledge and the research they're actually doing behind the scenes. Uh, so we are happy um, to see you all benefiting from that. Uh, one of the questions that we had is, uh, that maybe is coming closer to your experience is, uh, do you actually think that uh, the WHO did a good choice uh, and played well, I would say the reaction to the crisis and to the, to the, um, to the disease? Wow, uh, it's very hard. I'm sure that the WHO will go through a major transformation right now. I think the role of the WHO is crucial and extremely important. Uh, they were, it was important when they declared it as a public health of uh, emergency of international concern. It took them too long to declare it as a pandemic. Uh, and I think that they needed to be much more forceful in order to coordinate and standardize between countries because now there are lots of uh, uh, differences and to be much more forceful in terms of helping countries 
uh, to improve their testing uh, abilities. So I would say that it's a very kind of uh, problematic uh, response. Part of it was very important. Part of it, uh, I would like the WHO to be much more forceful and uh, and pushing uh, and pushing ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we'll we'll let you go to your uh, next meeting. Really, again, thank you, and we'll now uh, welcome back Yavon for uh, the Q and A with the with the students. Uh, so we thank hope you very to see much. Again. And uh, Yaron, it was a great lecture, and uh, <laughs> I'm leaving you all in uh, great hands. So uh, <laughs> bye bye. I'm sure we'll thank meet you, uh, later. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Um, so now we will uh, welcome back Yaron. Uh, so I will I will read you out. Uh, questions we can, like there is a few and um and then we can see uh, how we go uh, before we will have the italian student uh telling us her story uh back on the ground uh so one of the questions we had is um does the virus stay in the blood after getting over it once um, meaning if you get sick once um and you're past it you waited the days so now you're back on feet um can you get sick again I'll say two things. First of all, in this case, nobody really knows. Okay, it's important to say that nobody really knows because it's a new virus. One of the problems with something new is that nobody really understands how it behaves, what's going to happen, what does it really attack, what does it not really attack. So that's just something that people has to know, have to know. The other thing in, in regard of that, so like uh, Nadab said before, there's a serological test. One of the tests that I told you about, the one that works very quickly. So this test is actually... Um, this test is checking exactly that. It means that it checks all sort of things that could be in your body after the infection. Usually what happens with people who healed that already passed the, the infection and are okay is that the immune system already managed to kill the virus very quickly. And by the way, 90% of the population or 85% of the population don't even feel that they were infected. But yet their immune system, your immune system already has the memory. It has special cells, immune cells, that, has a, that have a special memory. And in the case that you may be infected again, which is a possibility, the reaction of the immune system will be so quick that you won't even feel anything. By the way, this is how every vaccine is working. You're being vaccinated before you get the flu. And even if you did get infected, you'll have very, very minor side effects or symptoms because your immune, immune system is already prepared for it. So basically once you're healthy, usually your immune memory, it's called, is there in order to prevent it from being reinfected in terms of getting the disease. Yet you could get infected again, but it doesn't mean that it will be something long. Usually it will be something short. One of the problems that even if you were infected and now someone will get, and you got healthy and someone uh, got infected again, there is a slight chance that until your immune system managed to eliminate the virus very quickly, there's a time that you may be still infectious. And that is why, for example, saying, so let's keep all the old people for two months and then the rest will be okay because everyone will be immune eventually. So it's not exactly true. And that's why it's not the best solution to just uh, create social distancing between old people and young people. Um, the second question we have is, um, um, so do you think there, there is a lot of theories about, um, how do you say, complots? Uh, do you think this, this virus was uh, actually the story that it was man-made uh, and it was actually... Um, oh, conspiracy, yeah. you mean? Yeah, conspiracy theories, exactly. Look, uh, I'll tell you the truth. First of all, if it... First of all, I have no idea, okay? I really have no idea. And if someone tells you that they know, then I'd suggest you go and ask them, how do they know? Because it's in China. The second thing that I will say, it doesn't make any sense in terms of a country to let something like that run out. It's this kind of processes. When I worked in an in infectious lab and I have some experience in the field, it's very, very, very hard and basically almost impossible to create a situation with something like that, for example, leaks out. It's, more, it's less than rare because there's so many layers of protection to prevent something like that, that it doesn't make almost any sense. If you talk about the conspiracy part of saying maybe the Chinese did it on purpose, why would they do it in China? Meaning why would someone go to Wuhan and do it there? It doesn't make any sense also. In my opinion, it was just a mutation. It could happen. Look, a few years back, we had not the corona, we had the SARS. 
we had the chicken flu. This kind of viruses sometimes pops up because of a mutation. You can't really, I don't think that then it was a, a, a biological warfare. And I also don't think it was this time. I think it was just a mutation. It was an interaction between humans and some kind of animal that had the virus. Chicken have it all the time. So it doesn't need to be bats or snakes or I don't know what. Usually it could come from a chicken. It could come from anything that you touch in nature. I had this, uh, I'll tell you a little story. It's a little bit funny. You know, in many caves in Israel, also all over the world, you have bats. Why does someone need to cook the bat or eat it in order, in order to get sick? You only need the bat to poop on you and then you'll get the virus, right? So I'm saying, in, having said that, I think it's just, uh, you know, nature works this way. There is some kind of uh, a coincidence and I think we had a very unfortunate one. <coughs> um, so so we're, we're coming to the... Um to one of the last questions. Oh, I have another one. Um, why didn't we stay home when we had the chicken flu? What's the main difference? There are a few differences. First of all, in the case of uh, bird flu, um, <clears throat> in the case of bird flu, the symptoms were much faster, meaning you didn't have to walk away, to walk around for a couple of days. And there was no difference between old and young. Everyone, everyone got sick. One of the problems here is that in many cases you have people who are actually sick but they don't know it because there are no symptoms for over a week. And in this case, you're like spreading everything. So that's one explanation. The other explanation is, by the way, the more that an agent like this agent is less, I would say less acute, meaning that the symptoms come fast, it means that the, the, the probability of the, let's say the authorities or the World Health Organization to find out that there's a problem is much lower. It takes longer time. Even in China, it took them a long time. You could say they tried to shut it up and not to tell anyone, but eventually even in other countries, look, Italy did what Israel did at the time. They blocked all the flights from, from China, but it wasn't enough because people who were already sick didn't know it and they walked around. So this is one thing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that, at least as far as I understand, this virus is much more infectious in terms of nonviolent ways. So if you don't even know that you're infected and you walk around and you spread it, and one of the things that was found, and it also happened with the SARS, by the way, which comes from the same family, you have something that is called super, super infectious people. For some reason, there are some people that spread the virus much more uh, aggressively than others. They don't, they don't do it on purpose. They're not even trying. They don't even know that they did it, but that's what happened in... Uh, in France, in the mountains, there was a British guy, I don't I think he was an actor or something, and he sat with his friends and infected, I don't know, dozens of people within a few hours, which is very rare. So there are all sort of explanations, but again, one of the problem with this kind of things is that it's chaos. It's very, very hard to learn about the virus quickly. And because of that, in this case, it also, because it was a silent infection, then people don't know and they continue to pass it on. That's why you really have to do that. Also, I think that one of the problems here was that until the old people and the sick, or I would say at risk population started to die, it took longer than usual. In bird flu, it was much faster. So the panic was higher. Okay, um, we'll come to the last questions because we also know you have a schedule on your head. Um, so the last, que last question is, let's say tomorrow morning, uh, someone <coughs> comes, up, comes up with a, a vaccine how much time would it actually take from someone finding the, the biological mechanism to, to vaccine against the, the, the COVID to having the whole world uh, getting the vaccine? Um, that's also a very good question. Um, I'll give you an example from swine flu. In swine flu, the vaccine was uh, developed, I think within six months in terms of being, uh, relevant, being available for many countries. The problem that was then is that it wasn't proven that it's really working. Many people, excuse me, that received the vaccine were actually very sick as well. So nobody really knew. In general, when you're talking about doing such a process, it takes between, I would say four to six, seven years. If the FDA wants to speed it up because there's a big uh, need, like in our case, the question would be, um, and there's always it's always a very, very big question. And that is, Let's assume that I have a vaccine, but I don't know if it's working. When I say I don't know that it's working, it's not only about protecting the patient from the virus. 
It's also that it doesn't cause other side effects. Some vaccines could actually kill you if they weren't tested first. And in some cases, because we're, we're dealing with nature, it's not computers, you'd never know what you'll get. And because of that, it's much more, I would say the FDA and the, uh, the EMA, the European uh, Medical uh, Agency, both are being reluctant to do things too quick because the danger could be much, much worse. Um, and in, if I go back to the coronavirus, I think that once there will be something that is proven, let's say about between 100 to 500 patients, which is very quick because almost everyone is getting sick. Um, in that case, the, the vaccine will probably be produced very, very aggressively. And I think that the question will be, there are two questions here. One will be, who do you vaccine? Because people who already had the disease, it doesn't help them to have the vaccine because they're already vaccinated. They're already protected by their own immune system. So you'll have to find out who do who does need to be vaccinated or they just vaccinate the whole population. So that is one thing. And the other question is, you're, we already have today about, I think they said 200,000 million, uh, 200,000 patients all over the world. The vaccine is a retrospective, um, is, is, an, uh, is a prevention mean, meaning before someone gets sick. I think that one of the problems now, how do we help the people who are already sick? One of the ways to do it is by creating the cure, what I said before, all sort of things that will prevent the activity of the virus. Meaning activity doesn't mean that the virus will cease to exist in your body, but for example, the whole process will take much less time. And much less times mean, for example, that the health organizations or the hospitals will have more time per patient. More time per patient usually uh, makes the chances for survival for a patient much higher. So I think that in general, it could take about a year, year and a half. That's also what I hear from the World Health Organization, not before. But again, it's really a question of if all the countries put their hands together in order to do it, it may work. I can say that in Israel, I hear about 10, 20 different companies trying to find all sorts of solutions, not only as um, prevention, also as treatment. But I think that it won't take it, it will take at least one or two or one and a half, one and a half years. The other thing that one need to keep in mind is that this is just the first wave. Coronavirus could come again in the winter, could come again a year back, a year later, it could come again two years from now. And that is why the vaccination is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. It was uh, amazing to have you with us. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of uh, students and people got a lot of experience out of, of the presentation. Uh, you also sent me the, the PowerPoint to share. So if people are interested, it would be available on the, the Wujas resources page. Uh, so feel free to just ask if you don't know where it is. Again, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was a pleasure. Safe. Thank you. Stay safe yourself. Uh, we will now welcome uh, Katerina, who is uh, our uh, board member of the World Union of Jewish Students. She's an, she's an Italian student, uh, just came back to Italy right now. Um, she will answer a few questions. If there is also questions from yourself, guys, feel free again to write them in the chat. Uh, we will try to answer as much as possible. Hi, Katerina, can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, as already Jonathan said, I'm Caterina Cognini. I'm an Italian university student, and I'm also a member of the board of uh, POGS with uh, the other members. And yeah, I had uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys about uh, well, how is the situation currently in Italy, because I guess we are hearing a lot on the news that uh, the situation here is going worse and worse every day, which is pretty dramatic. So it's very important for me to, let's say, try to be an example for countries that are the, not, already not at this level. So trying to spread the knowledge and how to behave. Amazing. Um, so first of all, we hope you're safe. Um, can, you, can you tell us maybe a bit about how it happened so quickly? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting because um, when everything started, I was in Erasmus in Paris until a few days ago. And I was there when everything started in Italy and it exploded really suddenly. It was a real escalation of 
uh, how the cases started growing, growing, and also how the situation in hospital became worse and worse every day. And I, so I was, I was very, very worried. I was trying to follow everything that was happening, even if I was in another country. And the concern of everyone was really rising also the question for from first of all for my family because as we, as we maybe you don't know but the north of italy is where i'm from is one of the uh the regions that are getting the worst cases and so the situation was going very fastly and so yeah the thing is that the italy mainly had two big uh let's say places where the which are actually it's crazy, the two really small cities that had the worst cases and from there it spread all around Italy. And so at the beginning of March, uh, let's say from the end of February and the beginning of March, the first decree start, the court decree for the government starting being released about before trying to limit your move your like movements from if they were not essential or for medical reasons, but they weren't still no compulsory. But then at the beginning of March, the 8th of March or the 9th of March, they became as probably in some of your countries already happened. Uh, the decree, a decree was released saying that people could not go out of home without a certification that attested they were going out for the supermarket or for medical reason or to work because still uh, some factories or so, still some shops were open. But yesterday night, the last decree was released and also all the non-essential factories, for example, or shops have to, have to close, which are not just only pharmacies and supermarkets can be open right now. So I'm, I'm in self-quarantine right now because uh, I came back from Paris last Tuesday on the 27th. And that day a decree was also released by the government say that people who came, Italy, who came back to Italy from abroad had to be in self-isolation for 14 days, not even being allowed to go out for supermarket or to go out with a dog. So I, uh, let's say five days ago, I started my isolation and I mean, uh, university is still goes on, uh, working remotely, not just all the Italian universities, also high schools are trying to adapt to, to work remotely in order to try to keep the life as normal as possible. Um, first of all, that's crazy. Um, yeah. it's, it's sad to have uh, one of the, of the countries that is an example for the rest to follow uh, in this kind of situations. Um, how was it for your uh, family to know that you were abroad? Like, was it also, was there a panic to bring you back home or to leave you out of Italy? Yeah, it, it, it's been really uh, difficult days and really anxious days because I was in Paris in those days, but also my sister, she was in New York for a stage. So my, my family had really uh, difficult days and especially because of the in the US for the ban uh, that happened in a few days. Like it was very intense days. My family trying to bring back my sister and after a few days trying to bring me back from Paris. I mean, I was luckily I was closer than my sister. But anyway, the situation was so difficult and crazy that every hour things were changing. So you could not even say I will take a train or a plane in three days because you, do, you have to do it tomorrow because you don't know what will happen in three days. So it was a very stressful situation. It was a running towards time to try because, yeah, also in Paris, this, in those days, the situation was growing worse. So at the end, it was, I prefer to be with my family in quarantine than in a, in a country which is not mine, living alone. So, yeah, it was very, very stressful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can I can understand that. And um, maybe can you tell us to we will close on that. This will be the, the last questions. And I'm also thanking all the people that watched the, the live and, the, and that follow us today. Um, maybe you can say about one positive things that uh, it has brought you to come back to your family to have more time to do other stuff. Uh, sometimes there is also positive in those hard times. So, well, for, for sure, like family is always family. So of course, being uh, in a place that you know with uh, the, the whole warm hug of your family for sure makes things, when you have this possibility, makes things easier. Uh, and for sure, uh, let's say it allowed us to, let's say, 
dedicate our time to other things, even if the university and school are still going on. So writing papers is always in my mind. But yeah, I would like to underline one thing that like following on social media, some Instagram uh, influencers, which I think it's been, been like, I, under, I, have, I understand and I totally shared it on points, uh, this quarantine probably had also some positive uh, outcomes, for example, for the environment and also other things. But I think that it's, it, we, don't, we don't have to forget that we are lucky to be on our sofas or in our bedrooms reading while there is people out there in hospitals giving their life for us. So I, I won't say that anyway, coronavirus, uh, let's say, I will not thank coronavirus for something because I mean, there is people who is doing it in social media saying, oh, thank you for these things that it can get totally crazy because there is really bad situation happening out there and we have to be aware of that and thank that we are safe in our houses and we have to stay in our houses. So stay home guys, because that's the only way to make this finish very, very soon. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for your questions. No, thank you, Katerina, for answering. Um, I will I will also say that um, there is a lot of campaigns going all around the world uh, online to fundraise for hospitals, especially in Italy, where uh, the number of people uh, compared to the number of beds are, and also because it started earlier than everyone else, has been so critical. Uh, so feel free to also like support, uh, even with small donations on this kind of, of platform. It's really, really important to uh, make sure that um, if you can make a little gesture, um, it's really worth it because tomorrow it might it might be the same situation in your countries. Yeah. Um, as as I think the scientists said it, um, stay home, stay safe. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We will provide a lot of more episodes on Zooflix coming up soon, uh, hopefully without the technical issues. Uh, and we wish you a very, very... Uh, Good evening uh, and good days, depending on where you, you look from. And see you soon, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.